Robert Nesta Bob Marley was a Jamaican singer, songwriter, and musician. He was a rhythm guitarist and a lead singer. One of his last albums was named Best Album of the 20th Century. Marley's music was heavily influenced by the social issues of his homeland and he is considered to have given voice to the specific political and cultural nexus of Jamaica. He was a musical prophet, and we recognize his contribution to the cry for justice for people of color. His best known hits include, I Shot the Sheriff, No Woman, No Cry, Could You Be Loved, Stir It Up, Get Up, Stand Up, Jamming, Redemption Song, one Love, and Three Little Birds, as well as the posthumous releases of A Low Soldier and Iron Lion Zion. The compilation album, Legend, released three years after his death, is reggae's best-selling album, going ten times platinum, which is also known as Diamond in the U.S., and selling 25 million copies worldwide. Greetings, St. John family, and welcome to today's virtual worship experience. Please be reminded that members of the finance team will be here today from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive your tithes and offerings. You may also take advantage of use of our cash app. Please be reminded that God loves a cheerful giver. And now let us be blessed with a word from our pastor, Reverend Washington. Good morning, and this is a true blessing to stand before you today once again in the wonderful house of God, that God has blessed us to join and worship God through and in. This is a day the Lord has made and I rejoice with you, and I am glad to be alive to see it. Gracious and God is so good to us to leave us this opportunity. I am Pastor Richard Allen Washington, and it is such a joy to be with you. This morning, I invite you to pray with me carefully. I invite you to open yourselves up to what God wants to do in this day of blessing us through the word. Let us pray. Eternal God, on this special and uniteful day, we pause where we are and what we've gone through, and we seek, O oh Lord, to bless your name with our worship we also seek to bless your name with hearing your word. So, Lord, open our hearts that we might receive this servant's testimony. Open our minds that we might grow stronger and wiser and bless us through the virtual realities that we are all that we need to be in Jesus Christ's name. We pray. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. And I do want you to join me in this passage of scripture. It's very lengthy, but it's something that God has for us to enjoy together. And I want to invite you with me to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, the word of God through Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. And in chapter 16, I invite you to come with me to verse number 19. And the passage that we shall share from this morning is Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Now, I cannot read all of that this morning. That would take a length of time that we don't have. So I want you to open your Bible and turn to it. I want you to look at it when you have a moment, but I need you to hear God speak to us from it. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31 is where the Lord places our attention and focus on today. It is a parable, a story, get this, of the rich man and Lazarus. This morning I am praying and I need you to pray with me even as this sermon is unfolding. I need you to pray with me that God would bless this moment of our sharing together. Pray for this, your preacher and your pastor at this time. The subject that we shall focus on today is from God, and it is entitled, The Miseducation of American Christianity. The Miseducation of American Christianity. My brothers and sisters, this subject comes from a book that I was 
forced to read in college and in seminary. It was a book that I found extraordinary and well-written. It was written by an author by the name of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. The original work is entitled, The Miseducation of the Negro. It was written in 1933 and it has a powerful message to it. Carter G. Woodson articulates that the system of education in America is not educating black people or black students. It is actually indoctrinating them on white supremacy and it is making them inferior and not educating or equipping, it is telling. My brothers and sisters, Carter G. Woodson declares that black people in America must go further than what they are experiencing in the school systems of America. He insists that black people must learn and learn how to learn on their own. They must turn to books and theories and philosophies and even religious understandings that are not always contained in the books that persons who push white supremacy agendas have for us. And so my brothers and sisters, when I read it, that stuck with me all these years, over 20 something years, it has stuck with me. And today I come to you very humbly and I have to admit that there is not only a miseducation of Negroes, there is also a miseducation of those who subscribe to American Christianity. My brothers and sisters, we find this and a similar circumstance in the parable, the story that Jesus lifts for us this morning in the Gospel of Luke chapter 16 in the 19th through the 31st verse. Luke, Dr. Luke, has a unique way of placing Jesus in a particular setting, setting where he is doing a little bit of what Carter G. Woodson attempts to do to those who are around him. There is a great crowd that is gathered around Jesus in this predicament. There are Pharisees, religious leaders, and religious people. There were disciples, those who were following Jesus, who really wanted to know the right way, the righteous way of doing some things. And there were those who were on the fence trying to decide whether they would follow after this prophet preacher Jesus who was doing extraordinary things. As the songs say in the late 90s, he's giving sight to the blind. He's healing the sick. He's walking on water. He's raising the dead. What manner of man is this that even the sea and the waves obey? This is what people are saying and they're following to see what he is going to do. My brothers and sisters, and in this kind of setting, Jesus, who has the Pharisees, the religious communities that are surrounding him, they had begun to pick at him. If you look at earlier parts of this 16th chapter, you will see that they were casually and critically looking at Jesus and watching everything that he was saying. And there came a moment where Jesus had had enough and he just directs their attention to a story about a rich man and a fellow that was poor named Lazarus. I want to educate you properly. I don't want you to be miseducated any longer on, in the Christian religion, or the Christian faith. You, you do need to know initially that this is not the first time that a religious extraordinary leader has told a historical story about a rich person and a poor person. The historical understanding of religion, which is very important for you to grasp Christianity. The rabbis of the old Jewish heritage, Judaism, had been telling stories about rich people and poor people a long time. Not only had they, but in the ancient world of the Egyptians, the Africans, hallelujah somebody, who are called Egyptians, had also been telling stories about rich and poor people down through the ancient days of history. So what am I saying? I'm saying to you that Jesus is not the first to grab the historical significance of rich and poor. What else am I saying? I want you to lift and know that the Bible is true, that there is nothing new under the sun. Humanity has been around longer than American society and will be once American society goes away. My brothers and sisters, Jesus picks up this historical story. He picks up this historical 
wisdom piece of literature and he shares it with the communities that have come around. Why? What is the point that Jesus would share such a historic story? What's the need for it? If the Jewish, Jewish or the Judaism had shared it, surely the religious people knew it. If the ancient Africans called Egyptians had shared it in their lineage as well, surely it was clear. But every now and then, just because something has been told to us, let me pause and put a spiritual kickstand down, hermeneutically spiritual, and say that just because you have been African Methodist for your entire life, just because you've been an AME all of your adult lives and know the order of service and the way that it's supposed to go, just because you have been Baptist, just because you have been Pentecostal, just because you've been non-denominational or Kojic or Presbyterian or Catholic, just because you've been a religious individual the majority of your life and you understand the heritage and the traditions of it, does not mean, my brother and sister, that you're clear on the purpose of it. You can go to church every Sunday and leave the same way you came. You can lift holy hands and say all things come of thee and praise God from whom all blessings flow. You can, you can share in the, the hymn of the church, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. You can recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Lord, who is received by the Holy Spirit. You can do all of that. You can announce the Decalogue. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You can share in all of the tradition and yet be the same after it's completed. Nothing changes. My brother and sister, and how? Are we supposed to be better every time we enter into a religious worship experience? The job is to be better, more informed, educated, equipped, and ready to serve God. I'm sharing with you, Jesus had a community that knew this, this story, this heritage, but they were miseducated in the system. They were miseducated, and this particular writer, Luke, is the one who helps in their miseducation. Why would Jesus tell it at this moment? Jesus, in Luke's gospel, is preparing to do something that is synonymous with his writing. Luke is that writer that always flips the script. He always turns the world of the righteous upside down. He has a way of taking God and bringing God a completely different way. He is always for the one who is on the outside, the margin of society and giving them something that those who are in the, watch this, not the margin, but the inside, he is always about turning the tables on them. And so he is a part of what Jesus is attempting to do. In this text, like Carter G. Woodson, Jesus is, watch this, attempting to correct a miseducation in religious understanding. My brothers and sisters, how many of us need to be reintroduced to a Christianity? How many of us in this setting now can acknowledge that you may have received some miseducation? I'm here today to tell you that there is a great issue of miseducation in American Christianity and God through Christ Jesus lifts this text today to help us as Jesus was getting ready to help those who were surrounding him, the Pharisees and the disciples. He is writing, Luke is, to correct. Jesus is telling the story to correct a misinformed group of people. What's the miseducation. Where are they miseducated? I'm glad you ask. They are miseducated, beloved, in thinking that if you are rich, you have the favor of God on your life. They are looking at the favor of God to show up in material gains, and that is all. The Pharisees were people who believed that if you were rich in things, that God was on your side. They believed that if you had 
enough money to pay not only your bills, but to double up in your 401k. If you had enough money to match your 401k every year, if you had enough money to buy whatever you wanted and then some, they believed that that meant God was on your side. They believed that if you drove and wore the nicest of the things that the world had to offer, that you were blessed and highly favored. Likewise, American Christianity believes that if you have the best of the best, if you drive, if you live in, if you attend, if you are a part of the best things that culture and religious circles have to offer, you are favored by God. There's no other explanation. The Pharisees are still alive today. My brothers and sisters, what's so powerful about this is even though they believe that about the rich and the wealthy, they believe the opposite about those who are unfortunately considered poor. They believe that if you were poor, God was not favoring you. They believe that if you had actually not enough to eat and not enough to drink, if your clothes were on rags, their last leg, if you will, if you were searching for places to sleep and searching for food to eat, that God was not favorable to you. And they put that in society and the culture that they were a part of. They believe that the poor were not blessed of God. And they believe that the poor had done something to get in their shape. That lives right now. Republicans and Democrats and even independents are guilty of believing that if you just do what you're supposed to do, if you pay taxes, if you go to school, if you get a job, then you will have everything that the quote unquote American dream says that you'll have. We have bought into that as people of color that I just need to go to school, I just need to get the right job, I just need to live in the right neighborhood, and everything will fall in place, and the Lord has favored me. We've even started to leave churches that we feel are not being blessed to go to churches where they've got everything laid out for us, and we don't have to want for anything to say that they are the blessed ones, and the churches that are struggling are the unfortunately non-blessed. Preachers have done it. We listen to preachers who we believe are blessed. We wouldn't hear John the Baptist talk about make, way, make straight the kingdom of heaven. The Lord is on the way. We wouldn't hear John the Baptist with his look and his ratchet way of talking. We would not go. We wouldn't even follow Jesus. Jesus ain't had no church building. He only had 11 people that stuck with him. And a crowd that followed him, we would not invite him to be the men's day or the church anniversary or the pastor's appreciation message. We wouldn't do that. He wouldn't be invited to preach at an annual conference. He would not be invited to come to a general conference or a national convention and preach. No, sir, not Jesus. He's not wealthy enough. There's a miseducation in American Christianity that believes that the best of the best is the blessed of the blessed. Oh, but I serve a God. I like Luke's gospel because Luke says, just when you think you have it figured out that the rich and the wealthy are blessed and the poor and the faint of heart are the unfortunately unfavored. Luke says, let me flip. Wait, first, let me do it this way. He says, let me clear my throat. <coughs> And he flips the script and has the words of Jesus tell us this story. Come here. Jesus says there was a rich man. He was so wealthy. He ate whatever he wanted. He parted. He threw great feast every day. Oh, Lord. He was eating the best of the best on a regular basis. He had the best tailors of the day. He wore, listen to this purple let me pause and say you know i was i was gonna be ugly and say he must have been an omega a q because he wore purple but i had to admit y'all know that purple is faded black of course but anyway 
Purple represents royalty. This man is not an ordinary man. He's not only rich, but he's a man of prestige and position. He wears the colors of royalty, which means he's high up in society. His clothing is the best of the best. His fabrics are not purchased at Dillard's, Belk, or J.C. Penney. His colors and fabric are not even purchased at Neiman Marcus or Nostrum or any of those high-end department stores or boutiques. No, his stuff is brought to him. But get this, Jesus goes so far as to say that his inner garments, his underwear, are made of linen. Child, this brother was so wealthy, he didn't get his stuff from Target, his underwear from Target. He didn't get his underwear from Walmart. He didn't get his underwear from the high-end haberdashery stores. This brother had his stuff made of linen and brought in. Whoo, brother was sure enough wealthy. When his underwear is made of linen, brother could breathe, right? <laughs> but Jesus says he could eat what he wanted, live how he wanted. How do we know it? I'll tell you that in a minute. You're not this wealthy living in the projects. You're not this wealthy living on the south side of the city. You're not living on the you're not living downtown any longer. You're living uptown. Gated communities. That kind of thing. But Jesus says, now, as the religious people begin to puff, puff their chest out because he talking good to them, he helps them by saying, but there was another man, Lazarus. The discrepancy, he gives Lazarus, who is poor, a name. Ooh. He does not give the rich man a name. Check that out. He says that Lazarus was so poor that his clothes were ragged and ratchet. He did not have sufficient clothing to cover him. And due to this, it's possible that his skin suffered from wearing the same clothes year after year, day after day. His skin suffered so much that it produced and manifested a skin disease that showed up with sores. The sores were so painful and overwhelming. He was so weak from being hungry and poverty stricken that his ailments grew worse. So much so that the friendships that he did have had to carry him to the gate, it is, of the rich man on a daily basis. You wanna know how we know how this rich man lived? Because whenever you see the word gates in historical religious literature, it is sufficiently saying that it's gated communities, palace-like, brother had gates. The poor man we know as Lazarus, was brought daily by friends and put at the gate to ask for some help and some assistance every day. My brother and sister, I want to pause and talk a little bit about the friends who bought him. You know, scripture in the New Testament helps us to understand the value of friends. Friends are not those who, who go shopping with you when you have money. Friends are not those who party with you when you have an excess and an overflow of funding. But real friends, biblically speaking, are not like the brother that was in Jazzman's Blues on Netflix. No, no, not like that brother. Real friends took you when you were weak and carried you to where it's possible that you got what you needed. I don't know about you, but do you have real friends that would carry you to the proper places that could possibly support your effort to become well? Do you have the kind of friendships that would carry you in your stinky, ridiculous, ratchet state, would not care what you look like or smell like, but would actually get you where you needed to be. Do you have friends like that? This brother, poor Lazarus, had friends like that. They carried him there. And I want to say a word because it's important that you know that this 
religious story and the name Lazarus used by Jesus does not suggest, beloved, that it is the Lazarus in the Gospel of John. No, no connection. This is a different one. Remember, Lazarus was a popular name at that time. Oh, Laz, poor man. The story unfolds that he was so weak from being poverty stricken that when his sore all over his body, when his sore skin was agitated and itching, he was so weak that when the dogs came to lick him, he was so wearied, he didn't have the strength to fight them off because he was so weak from being hungry and poverty stricken. You're in bad shape when you don't have the strength to fight off those who come to attack you. But I know what that's like. Do you? Do you know what it's like to be so wearied and so weak from just trying to get up out of the bed on a daily basis that you don't have the strength to fight off the rumor and the lie and the gossip and the mistreatment of people who are saying things about you that you know is not true, but you don't have the energy to fight it off. You just let them have its way. Jesus gives us a clear difference, rich, poor, rich, poor, and descriptions are different. But oh, Jesus says just when the religious people would be sitting with their chests poked out and their nose looking down at those who were around the scene that were like Lazarus, poor, didn't have much. Jesus says, but they died. Got to get out of here. But they died. And when they died, come here, Jesus describes the death experience. He says the poor man dies, Lazarus dies first. And when Lazarus dies, it is stated, beloved, that Jesus says that the angels from heaven took him directly to Abraham's presence and bosom. Shortly thereafter, he says that the wealthy man dies, the rich man dies with no name. And he's very clear. That there's a burial. Woo. I don't know how it was done. I don't know how the poor man Lazarus was buried. Or I don't know if he had a funeral. But you and I have just watched last month the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. You know you watched it. Tell the truth. And did you see the pageantry that went along with that? You see how they treated her? Child. Some people are treated better in death than some people are treated when they are living. Queen Elizabeth was treated well the way she was treated in her death and what was happening was even better than poor people had been treated even in their day of living. But I've come to tell you that it doesn't matter when both rich and poor die. We go in a box that's made of the same stuff and we go in a hole that's dug in the same ground. Woo! I got to quit. We have to come back and do a part two of this. But Jesus starts flipping their miseducation right there. When it dies, the rich man is said to have lifted his eyes in hell, Hades. Now I want to correct something for you. I want to inform your miseducation. This text is not about hell. Although hell is mentioned, although hell is one of the areas of interest in Jesus sharing it, he is not telling us that the rich man died because he's rich and ended up in hell because he's rich. He is not saying that the poor man dies and ends up in heaven because he's poor. No. I want to Correct some miseducation. This is not about who's going to hell. And it's not about who's going to heaven. That is not the point of this particular passage and story. Jesus has another point in mind. He is reversing and Luke is the kind of writer that likes to do it. Luke will take what you think you know and make it a lie. And I want to pause and say to each one of us, Jesus intends to correct the miseducation of religion for the Pharisees in this. How does he do it? 
He says to them, the rich man who they felt would have certainly been in heaven because he's rich is actually in hell. And he looks up when he wakes up in hell and says, oh Lord, Abraham, my God. I want you to catch the symbolism. Can you let Lazarus dip his hand in the water and drip some on my tongue? It's hot down here and I'm in agony down here. I'm struggling down here. And Abraham says, son, you missed it. Abraham identifies him as a part of the family. Don't miss this. You can be religious, a part of the chosen people of God and still bust hell wide open. Going to church is not going to get you to heaven, but it sure won't keep you, it sure won't keep you out of hell either. So why do I go to church? You go to grow, to worship. You are made to praise God and you praise God in the church and you praise him in the outside. You are praising and worshiping and the scripture says you gather with other believers so that you are strengthened one with another. That's why you do it. You assemble that you become better, that you encourage one another. This text, Jesus flips the script. Luke doesn't deny that the rich man is a son. Abraham says, son, you remember when you were living, you had all of the good stuff happen to you. Let me pause and say that I don't want everything good to come to me now. I want good stuff. I want to live well, not denying it. But I do know that there are some blessings that I want God to give when I get on the other side. I, I want the blessing of seeing my loved ones again. I want the blessing of seeing my father. I want the blessing of seeing my aunts and my uncles. I want the blessings of seeing friendships and loved ones that are close, that have transitioned to the other side. I don't have to get everything God has for me on this side. That's a miseducation of American Christianity, to believe that everything God has for you ought to manifest itself now. No, sir, no, ma'am. God's got some blessings that this world cannot hold for us. Jesus says that the wealthy rich man is not denied his sonship. Abraham calls him son, which means Abraham knows him, but he's still in hell. Ooh, what a <sighs> indictment. To have been religious your whole life by nature and end up in hell. Text says, Abraham tells him, but you, you, you got everything you were blessed with in your lifetime on earth. And Lazarus got everything evil and low down and treacherous happened to him while he was on earth. But the flip has come. <laughs> Listen, one of my favorite television shows you already know is Blue Bloods. And I was watching an episode this past week, not the newest one. You should check it out. It's good. But I was reviewing an old one. And uh, Danny, one of my favorite characters on Blue Bloods, partner Baez had just experienced a rough experience and was in the hospital and didn't know if she was going to live. And Danny was having a hard time with it because he had lost his wife and so much had happened to him. It was a hard season for Danny that year. And, 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 and Danny said to his father, Dad, who is Tom Selleck, Frank Reagan, says, Dad, if bad things keep happening around you and with you, does it mean that you are really bad? Frank took a deep breath, looked at his son, and said something that really stuck with me and does now. And this is a word for those who are Christian. Frank said, you need to shift your weight. He says, you search for trouble. You are a policeman, a detective. Your job is to seek and destroy that which is evil. That's what you do for a living. And when you do that and you look for evil every day of your life. When you get up 
to, to stop evil from happening. Frank Reagan said that you're eventually going to run into some evil in your days. Come here for a minute. Some of us need to shift our weight. We believe that because we're in a season, a year, or a few years of this kind of trouble happening and trouble happening and trouble happening, that it might mean that we are unfortunately just as bad as the bad things happening to us. But I've come to tell you, if you are a Christian, if you're a preacher, if you're a servant of the Most High God, you get up. And because you get up on a daily basis, evil is all around you and you're going to throw it. Your, your life is about giving praise in spite of it. You got to shift your weight and realize that some of the stuff I'm catching is because I battle against it every day. We war not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in high places. Sometimes you're going to have to deal with it. Shift your weight. The miseducation is that sometimes people have adapted that because you have bad stuff happening, you are a bad apple. That ain't the case. Sometimes the enemy knows how much God has placed on the inside of you and God is allowing the enemy to bend you and to, watch this, break you so that the best of who you are might come forward. Shift your weight. He says, bad things happen to him in life. Good things happen to you. And now we are gonna flip the script. And there is something that's between us that will not allow you to have all the good stuff in your lifetime on earth and have it in heaven too, in the afterworld. No, sir, no, sir, I wish that we had more time. I got to get out of here, I'm gonna shut it down, but I got to celebrate. Because do you know that we have that kind of miseducation in politics and in American Christianity? We believe that the wealthy are the favored and deserve the best that the world has to offer, and the poor and the struggling and the straining and the barely having their ends to meet are those who are unfavored and don't deserve the equal rights and opportunities for a better life than those who already have it. That's what's wrong with those who oppose affirmative action. That's what's wrong with those who want to miseducate. I gotta say this and I'm gone. Whew. There was a reporter that came on and spoke about the issue of slavery and how would a white anchor address slavery? and the remnants of it. The white anchor said, well, we gotta go back to the origin originators of slave trading, which happened to be Africans, and that they started this so they should pay reparations to all others who were affected by it. And the reporter didn't know how to respond. I wished I had had him see if he had, he had, he had gone to the ITC, he would know better. He would have known that the origin of the trade was not in slaves in Akubalan. The origin of the trade was in goods and tariffs. But Europeans saw a chance to distort that handshake and, uh, how can I say it, gullible sense of the kingships and said, what we will do now is not take goods and tariffs and trade with you. What we will do is take persons that you have captured in war and they have become uh, prisoners of your wars. We will indenture them and make them servants and we will give you more for the servants instead of for the tariffs. That's how that started. Miseducation. Now let me get out of here. I will be back for part two of the miseducation of American Christianity. I want to put a footnote here and pause, shut it down, and come back next Sunday. Pray that you will allow yourselves to sit with me next week. Pray that God will allow me to even be here. How do you shut it down? I shut it down on this. God is a God who is constantly flipping the script in our lives. The stories that are told and how the narratives of life for us have gone does not equate 
that God cannot change it. At a moment's notice, in death, in the shift of a season, God can turn your life from poverty to power. God can turn your life from where you are poor, not only physically and with material things, but maybe you are poor in your spirit. God can turn where you're poor in your spirit to having purpose, productivity, and watch this, production. Get out of here. Have a good week. May the Lord God bless you real good. But my soul is happy because I live in the hope and the expectation that my God will change my circumstances. Where I'm weak, God can make me strong. Where I'm weary and worn, God can build me up. Where you have been sick and demented and dejected, you serve a God at a moment's notice who can transform your circumstance. See you next week. May the Lord bless you real good.